Today, I'm exposing the biggest fear all woodworkers have, revisiting something that I haven't done in years. In fact, last time I did it, it cost me $5,000 in damages. So that $5,000 check that they wrote me a couple weeks ago and I had cash, I now had to write them a $5,000 check. Tell the truth about a machine that all of you have been hounding me to buy, almost catch my apartment garage on fire, again, and out myself as being a huge liar. Oh, sh And thanks to Fiverr for sponsoring today's video. This isn't right. Let's start with that part about me being a liar. I have a confession. Two videos ago, I mentioned how pre-milled lumber or lumber that you buy from a store and it's already clean, flat, and sanded is the biggest scam in the woodworking world. And it truly is. But then why am I using pre-milled walnut here? Seems like that kind of makes me a liar, right? Well, let me explain. I typically buy all of my lumber from a local sawmill. They recover fallen trees, slice them up into boards, dry them out so they're ready to be made into furniture, then sell them direct to the consumer without ever shipping anything across the country. This inherently makes the price significantly cheaper than a big box store. But a few weeks ago, I drove over there, walked into the barn, and picked out my lumber as I usually would, but there was no one in sight. I walked all around the property, even called the phone number, and after an hour, still never found a single person. So unfortunately, I had to put everything back and head to one of those big name wood supplier stores and pay an arm and a leg for this walnut, about 40% higher than what I would have paid at the barn, but that's not the worst part. This lumber is supposed to be the highest quality in the area, even says so on their website. But you will notice that it's mainly sapwood, has tons and tons of large knot holes, and worst of all, I paid for it to be flat. And it's not flat. But holy cow, look at the knot holes. Now structurally, this is not, see what I did there? <laughs> not a big deal but visually it's something that I wanna to try to avoid. This knot here first didn't seem like it was going to be that much of an issue. I just pried out all the loose bits with some pliers, but then realized that all the wood around it was super soft and rotted, so I needed to remove that too, which resulted in my chisel going all the way through the board. But I'm not done yet. I need to remove all of that soft rotted wood in order to proceed. Once I was done, the hole was large enough that I could fit two fingers, three fingers, and even four fingers inside with ease, like your mom. But unlike your mom, this can be fixed. First thing I needed to do was create a barrier. Now, you will see tons of folks get overcomplicated and use melamine with silicone caulk or that super expensive like tuck tape or Tyvek tape stuff, but here's the truth. I just use cheap, clear packing tape and some hot glue. It's faster, easier, and significantly cheaper. Now, one thing that I have started doing when working with messy substances is doing everything inside of this tray that I made for melamine. Just in case I spill liquids or have some sort of epoxy mishap, all of the mess is contained inside here and doesn't pour out all over my workbench, table saw, or floor. I'm going to be filling all of the holes with some Total Boat Thick Set Epoxy that I will tint black. And if you ever wanted to try this stuff out for yourself, there's a link in the description that automatically applies a discount that you can't find anywhere else to help you save some money. I've also included tons of other exclusive coupon codes for you to help save you even more money on the products and tools I'm using in this video. As always, everything is linked down in the description. After the epoxy cures in a few days, actually, I should explain that I had to use a longer curing time epoxy in this instance, since the knot holes were so large and so deep that a faster curing epoxy would have had a bad chemical reaction where it starts smoking and cracking if you try to fill large voids. Anyway, that epoxy was rock hard and ready to be processed down. Honestly, I found that just blasting it with a sander and some low grit sandpaper is the fastest and easiest way to get down to a flat board. No, it's not elegant, but it works. See, 
this pre-milled lumber isn't actually flat. And that's what frustrates me. You pay all that extra money to have them mill the boards flat, but they are never flat. So here's something that all of my Patreon supporters who get access to all my behind the scenes videos, get free merchandise like t-shirts, and get to watch all of my YouTube videos, including this one, way before they go live to the public, have known about for a few months now. After years and years of using alternative methods to mill my own lumber flat, I finally broke down and bought one of these benchtop joiners that everyone's told me to try. Now, I paid for it with my own money and have no affiliation with the brand, so I will tell you the truth. First off, calling it a benchtop model is silly. I am six foot four, and using this on top of a bench put the wood in a super awkward position, so I have to use it on the floor unless I build a dedicated stand for it. This is a 10 inch wide joiner with helical head cutters and even face joining about a seven inch wide board with a super, super, super shallow cut. Feels like this thing is severely struggling. And at $650 that this thing costs, it's both a disappointment and kind of what I expected from it. It did get the faces of my boards relatively flat. I mean, close enough to be able to run the opposite side through the planer but I've gotten significantly better results using my sled and hot glue method that I typically use. But rather than cluttering this video up with a full review on this jointer, if you wanna know more about my impressions of this jointer and whether or not I think it's worth buying, check out my Patreon page where I've made a full length review video plus several follow-up videos. Patreon is the place where I post tons and tons of videos without having to stress about how they perform here on YouTube. Edge joining on this thing is much, much easier, but the fence doesn't really stay locked in perfectly square with the bed of the jointer, which can lead to less than perfect edges. Even with those less than perfect edges, I am still close enough to straight that I can rip a parallel edge on the opposite side on the table saw. And there's another tool that doesn't perform great. See all the dust shooting everywhere? That's because I work out of my apartment in a single car garage, and I only have one single 15 amp circuit to run tools off of. That means I am not able to run my table saw and dust collector at the same time without blowing the circuit, which I have done too many times to count. <laughs> and yes, as thousands of you have told me, the obvious solution would be to upgrade the breaker or run another circuit to the garage. But again, this is an apartment garage. I do not own it, and the electrical panel is located inside a different garage, so I have absolutely no way to change anything with the electrical system in here. But that will be changing soon. More on that in a second. One of the most repetitive things in woodworking is gluing up panels like this, so I wanna offer you a few pro tips to make the process smoother. First, stop cranking down on your clamps with the jaws of life. You really don't need much clamping pressure to bring the boards together and get perfect glue seam. Just turn the handle until you see a little squeeze out and you're done. Second, when putting on clamps, put some on the top and some on the bottom to help evenly distribute the clamping pressure. And third, sure, you can use alignment aids like biscuits, dowels, or dominoes to keep all the boards in line during a glue up, but they really aren't 100% necessary. Instead, try tossing some clamps on the end of each board to pull them in line with one another. It's a lot cheaper and easier. Oh, and bonus tip. You really don't need to keep things in clamps for a ridiculously long period of time. Maybe two to three hours, and then you can move on. It'll save you time. Speaking of moving on, one of the comments that I see more than about anything else is how I'm not a real woodworker because I don't use hand tools. So for all of those angry people bashing holes in their keyboards because I don't use outdated and antiquated tools, this one is for you. I went out and bought all kinds of hand tools to try them out. And I have to admit, yes, they do work really well when they're sharp, but they require a ridiculous amount of setup, fine tuning, sharpening, resharpening, resharpening again, and let's not forget about the physical exhaustion of using them. Instead of being stuck in our ways, I prefer to embrace innovation that makes my life easier. I believe one of the great philosophers of our time said it best. Come to think of it, 
you probably know him too. Let's see what he has to say. We're not cavemen. We have technology. We have technology like a large sander that I can clean up this giant panel way faster than a hand plane. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that hand planes are useless. Not at all. But when it comes to doing certain tasks, why would you trap yourself into a corner and only use hand tools when there are other tools that do the job faster, easier, and oftentimes cheaper? I mean, could you imagine ripping off that piece of wood with a hand tool compared to just running it through the table saw? The real reason is that people are afraid of change. People get set in their way of doing things and get comfortable. Why do I say that? Because nearly all woodworkers, including myself, are so stuck in building projects that have perfect 90 degree angles, perfectly flat panels, and not a single curve or organic shape to be found anywhere. And that is where this project comes in. I wanted to push myself outside of my comfort zone and do some things I have really never gotten comfortable with. Organic, free-flowing shapes, complex compounding angles, and free-handing without guides or restraints. So although I spent the last 8 to 10 minutes, but in reality it was like 2 weeks, getting these panels perfectly flat and perfectly square, I'm going to undo all of that work now. I'm starting the process over on my little Tykes bandsaw, which is admittedly a tool that I don't use enough, and that's because it's a tool that, at least in my head, is not known for being incredibly precise or accurate. For the most part, it's heavily reliant on freehand cuts, which is something that most woodworkers stray away from. However, it allows me to safely remove the bulk of material so that I can jump into the next uncomfortable thing, really weird angles. The full step-by-step -step plans for this project are available on my website, and they're also linked in the description below, but they tell me to set my saw not to, you know, 15 degrees, 30 degrees, maybe even 45 degrees. No, they tell me to set the blade to 53.5 degrees. That's something that you definitely won't find written on your saw, so you need one of these digital angle gauges to set it up properly. Here's something that I've also never done. Because these pieces are larger than the capacity of my miter gauge, I flipped the miter gauge backwards to make the cut, which worked surprisingly well. And when you make cuts like this, I find it much easier and safer to take small bites and slowly sneak up on that final cut, just in case there's tension in the wood and it wants to bind and grab onto the blade. Now I realize that this time you have absolutely no idea what I'm building, but it's going to be an end table that's kind of angled like this. But there will be multiple sets of this strange shape kind of intertwined with one another. Just be patient. I promise it'll become more clear very soon. I want these pieces to miter into one another to make it look like they're one cohesive piece. So I'm going to miter the edges where they meet. It is a super, super strange angle, but that's what my math told me I needed to do. This might be the one time in my life where I actually use the Pythagorean theorem, I think it's called, to figure out those angles. See? My sixth grade geometry teacher, Miss Main, was right. All those theorems that you're forced to memorize actually have a real world application. They probably just didn't think it would be when I'm in my 30s making woodworking videos on YouTube. Because I refuse to spend a bunch of money on those pre-made tapering jigs, I always just use some scrap pieces of wood to make my own. This process is super easy. Just line up the edge of the sled where I want to cut the wood, then grab some scrap pieces of wood and glue them down. I find it helpful to use super glue and wood glue so that you can progress through the project much faster. And because we were running this through the table saw, I always like to reinforce things with some screws on the bottom, you know, kind of the belt and suspenders approach. Now I can screw down some other scraps to act as clamps, and this piece is rock solid and ready to be run through the table saw. Then I can run this whole contraption through the blade, unscrew one piece, pop in another one, tighten down the screws again, and I'm ready to rock. Now you probably noticed a little problem, and that's that my blade is incredibly dull, making the cut really difficult. But there's an even larger issue that you can't see yet. Right, let's see how this goes together. Oh, 
This isn't right. I think I can fix this though. Yeah. Remember how I thought my Pythagorean theorem skills were up to par? They weren't. Oh, okay. And my angle and measurements were way off. In fact, I attempted this cut about three or four more times and messed it up every single time. My math skills suck. So to fix things, I started off by gluing on some larger blanks of wood to bring the pieces back to a larger size before retrying the cut. Because my math was clearly wrong, and if you listened to my podcast, Off the Cut, you knew that I struggled with this dilemma for weeks trying to figure out the exact right measurements and angles. So I decided to reach out to someone with much better 3D design and production skills that I have. Meet Nicholas. Nicholas is an industrial designer experienced in furniture and consumer electronics who I found on Fiverr. Fiverr connects people like you and me with freelancers that can offer a massive selection of digital services like furniture design, 3D modeling, video editing, and interior design, just to name a few. In fact, I actually sent Nicholas photos of my living room and asked him to design a modern and unique piece of furniture for me to create in this video. Fiverr even has a freelancer consultation service that connects you with one-on-one -on -one consultations, which is a great alternative to off-the-shelf purchases or communicating with freelancers through messages. Fiverr makes the process of finding a high-quality freelancer, like Nicholas, incredibly easy. User reviews, portfolios of past projects, and even lists of previous clients allows you to find the perfect match. Nicholas provided me with high-quality renderings of this piece of furniture and a Fusion 360 3D model, which in turn allowed me to fully conceptualize all the specific cuts and measurements I needed to make in order for all this to work out, which is significantly easier than the Pythagorean theorem. And from that, I was able to make a fully detailed set of plans that contains every single measurement you need to build this table for yourself. Without Nicholas's help, I truly don't think I would have been able to figure out all of the complex intricacies of these compounding angles, and this video may have never seen the light of day. So huge shout out to Nicholas for helping me out, and head to fiverr.co slash Spensley to check out the services available to you and get 10% off with code Spensley. But let's talk about the smoke. This is 100% caused by me trying to force this massive piece of hardwood through an incredibly dull blade. The dullness caused heat to build up, which causes natural resins in the wood to bind to the blade. It gets so thick that you can scrape it off with a chisel. Don't be like me. Change your blades when they get dull. Just look how much burning is on that cut. Okay, so back to what I was saying earlier about a big change. I've been working in this small apartment garage for about four years now. Well, it has been great and is a massive step up from when I started woodworking in the parking lot of my apartment. In the near future, I'm going to be stepping away from this garage and all of this. But first, let me pause for a second to show you now that these pieces kind of resemble what I'm going after, so we're on the right path, but let's cut down the top and bottom real fast. So when I say stepping away from all of this, I mean that I'm moving on to something new. What's the new thing, you ask? Well, I'm moving out of the apartment and into a house. Well, we are moving into a house. And by we, I mean my new wife and I. I just got married about two months ago and just got back from the honeymoon a few weeks ago, which is why there's been a little bit of a gap between this video and my last video. But I am super happy to be back and working on more projects. I don't know how many videos it will be until we do move, but I'm really excited for this next step in my woodworking as I will be able to do things like run my table saw and dust collector at the same time, which is a uh, luxury I've never experienced. I will also be able to finally have air conditioning so I don't experience 115 degree summers and single digit winters in this garage. To assemble this table, I'm gonna use a tool that everyone has, the domino. I like to do things the easy way, so rather than doing complex measurements, I like to use what I call the folding method. All you do is line up your piece where you want it to go and then fold it over. To make sure I don't mess things up, I like to make a few visual indicators though. Then I just make one plunge horizontal, horizontally, is that a word? Let's go with it. I'll make one plunge horizontally using a spacer block to get the mortise high enough up into the piece that it doesn't poke through. Then 
see here, that's the folding action I mentioned. I know that I can just plunge vertically. Vertically? Sorry, let me know in the comments if those are actual words. Uh, I plunge vertically into the opposing piece again with that spacer block. And see, without any fancy math or measuring, those pieces line up perfectly. But there's one problem. They interfere with one another. But that's an easy fix. An angle grinder with a flap disc can take care of that right away. But this is a woodworker's nightmare right here. I just got rid of those flat edges and introduced a free floor, free, free form, there we go, a free form organic shape. Buckle up, kids. This is where I'm gonna be taking this project next. That super cheap flap disc is basically just a very aggressive sandpaper that allows me to carve out the recess so those pieces don't interfere with one another. A little bit of glue and this table is together just as it was designed. You could absolutely stop here, do a little sanding, throw some finish on it, and this table would be done. But I'm gonna do something a little bit different, something that most woodworkers are very afraid of doing. So let's get to the fun part. I'm gonna force myself to step outside the bounds of perfect measurements and cuts and venture into the land of power carving. Now, if you're familiar with my entire back catalog of videos, you've probably seen me power carve in the past, but it's been probably, I don't know, two, maybe three years since I've done it, and I am excited to get back into it again. I've made a bowl out of sheets of OSB plywood. I've made this plywood spoon holder thing. I've made a bowl from a live edge slab. Then I stepped up and made this media console. Then I got commissioned from a local brewery to make them a custom table only to ruin it and lose $5,000. So that $5,000 check that they wrote me a couple weeks ago and I had cash, I now had to write them a $5,000 check. But that's a story for a different video. Now that project is definitely one that made me want to avoid power carving, but today I'm getting back into it. You do not need any fancy equipment to get started. An angle grinder and a cheap flap disc is all you need. And while this absolutely works, it's incredibly slow and as you can see, it makes a ridiculous amount of dust. Plus, it burns out these discs really fast. Now, because most people out there don't know a lot about power carving, they apparently don't know a lot about the tools involved in it. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time highlighting the tools that make power carving more enjoyable. This one is called the ArborTech Turboplane. It attaches to any angle grinder and has teeth that create shavings of wood instead of covering your shop with super fine dust. See how much faster progress I can make compared to the flap disc? But let's be honest here. It throws those chips everywhere. And if that's something you want to avoid, ArborTech makes an angle grinder dedicated to power carving called the power carving unit, which you can connect a shop back onto and suck up the majority of the mess. Now, while I did rely on someone else to give me the basic concept for this piece of furniture, the power carving was entirely my own imagination. I wanted to test out the possibility of carving organic shapes into larger aspects of my furniture, which is something that I've never done before. I don't want to make the same thing over and over and over again, which is why I very quickly got out of producing cutting boards and wooden coasters for craft fairs. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not something that was enjoyable or interesting to me. I wanna always push myself out of my comfort zone and try new things. One of those brand new things I'm gonna try is this carving disc from ArborTech called the Turbo Scraper and see how it performs too. I'm very familiar with the Turbo Plane, but this Turbo Scraper feels pretty similar but with a less aggressive cut, almost like it gives you more control. It's truly hard to describe until you've tried power carving for yourself, but I swap back and forth between the two discs before trading out to my all-time favorite carving attachment from ArborTech, the ball gouge. This one allows you to really work into tight spaces and is essential for this project to carve those hard to reach places where the angle grinder typically wouldn't reach. Now, I've got a couple pro tips for power carving for you. One, you 
absolutely need to wear a respirator because as you can see, it kicks up a huge mess. Two, obviously, wear safety glasses, people. You do not want shards of wood flying into your eyes. Three, something that I put off for a bit, but you'll see me toss on in a minute, is wear a face shield. It's so much nicer to not have to worry about stuff flying up into your face. That's what she said. Or he said. It makes the whole experience much, much nicer. And four, don't try to take super, super heavy cuts forcing the grinder into the wood. Take multiple light passes and slowly work your way to the design that you want. If you want to try power carving out for yourself, check out all the tools I'm using by clicking the link in the description below or scanning this QR code on screen. ArborTech was nice enough to provide all of you an exclusive 10% off code that's linked down in the description to use on anything on their website to get you started into the world of power carving. One word of caution I will give you is that if you wanted to get started in power carving and you have a cordless angle grinder, make sure you have plenty of backup batteries. Power carving is really demanding and will burn through your batteries very quickly, which is why I actually recommend going for a corded angle grinder. You will get much more power, which helps you take deeper cuts, and you have limitless run time, so you don't get annoyed when your cordless batteries die every five minutes or so. Don't be surprised when you make mistakes, like I did here, and exposed a domino tendon. Yep, that was definitely not part of the plan, but no worries, there's an easy fix for that. One of the other power carving tools from Arbortech is their turbo shaft. It's got this adjustable collar, that way you can prevent yourself from plunging too far into your work piece. Now, was this part of the plan? <laughs> Absolutely not. But that's the beauty of power carving. We don't make mistakes. mistakes. We have happy accidents. All right, so now that I've got one half of this thing carved, I need to flip it over and work on the other half. But first, I know what you're thinking, Eric. This looks terrible. You're not gonna leave it like that, are you? Of course not. I'm gonna address this a little bit later, clean everything up, but for now, I need to work on this side. Now, I'm sure you've been thinking the entire time how bad this looks, and I know, I know. I thought the exact same thing when I started getting into power curving. You are not going for perfectly smooth surfaces here. Rather, just trying to go after the rough shape. The first time I tried power curving, I spent forever taking super shallow cuts, trying to keep everything as smooth and as crisp as possible. The reality is you don't really need to worry about that right now. Get your rough ideas down on the wood and then you can come back and refine things later. One of my biggest pet peeves about YouTube videos is when you click on something you think you might be interested in, but the first five minutes of the video is someone staring at the camera, giving you their entire life story, asking you to comment, like the video, subscribe to their channel, and do nine laps around the sun. I've never seen you or your channel before. Why would I do all of that when I don't even know if I enjoy what you put out for me to watch? It's a lot like my friend, uh, let's call him George. George will meet women, ask them out on a date, and literally, before the first date even happens, he's hammering home about what they would name their kids, what kind of house they would have, wanting her to come to Christmas dinner, and wanting her to give a eulogy at his grandmother's funeral. George hasn't even taken her to Olive Garden for unlimited soup salad and breadsticks for $11.99 yet. George hasn't given her a reason to want to go on a second date, let alone a first date. But unlike George, if you have made it this far in the video, I've kept your interest for about 25 minutes or so, which means statistically speaking, You've made it through a significantly larger portion of the video than most viewers, which means you must be at least mildly entertained. If you think I've earned a second date and are interested in seeing more videos that I put out in the future, consider hitting that subscribe button. And if you think this video sucks, leave a comment below saying Summer of George, so I know your disapproval. And yes, George is a real friend. He's single. All interested parties wanting to go on a date with George, please send headshots, resume, and cover letter to Spence the Design Co. 1747 Old Tangent River Road, number 1330, Columbus, Ohio, 43212, United States. Whew. So after hours and hours and honestly, a couple days, the carving is completely done. And I know what you're thinking, Eric, it still doesn't look great. That's where this next step comes in. And unfortunately, that's sanding. 
Yes, you could absolutely take some sandpaper and do it all by hand, but I've got a much, much easier way. Enter the Arbortech Contour Sander. This is yet another attachment for an angle grinder that has this flexible head that, like the name says, contours into all the, well, contours of the project. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. Sanding absolutely sucks. It's super tedious, boring, and takes an insanely long time. But that's the perfect time to pop in some Bluetooth hearing protection. It's actually a discount code down in the description to help you save some money. So you don't have to hear, but instead can listen to my podcast off the cut and learn about all the projects I'm working on before they're released here on YouTube, listen to interviews with all your favorite YouTube woodworkers, and learn about the business aspects of running a business through YouTube. The contour sander is great for small details, but I really like throwing these foam pads on my regular sander, which bend and wrap around all of the curves. You don't have to buy these name brand ones either. You can buy some cheap ones on Amazon for just about any sander that you might own, and they're perfect, not just for power carving, but for sanding things like roundovers on tabletops or legs without doing that awkward wrist stance thing and making unintentional flat spots on your work. I will leave a link to these and all the other tools I'm using today down in the description to save you a little time. But I'm not joking here at all. The sanding for this project literally took days and days and days and days and days. So long, in fact, that while working in the hot summer heat, one of my overhead lights burn out, which is why there's some awkward lighting in the next minute or two. Don't worry, new lights are on the way. With a lot of the behind the scenes videos that I upload on Patreon, I asked the community for their opinion on how I should go about certain aspects of the projects. The overwhelming response about the top of this table is I need to soften and blend it in with the middle structure. And if you wanna be part of that sounding board, check out the link down in the description below. Whew, well, after what seems like an absolute eternity of shaping and sanding, this thing is looking pretty good. However, there's a little bit of a problem. Because this base is completely flat, if it's on a flat surface like this workbench, there's no problem. But take this thing in the real world, inside of a house, where the floors are not perfectly flat and this thing is gonna wobble like crazy. But there's an easy fix. Have you ever wondered why your dinner plates, bowls, and coffee mugs have a ring around their base? No, it's not some sort of stylistic element. It is purely utilitarian. That ring decreases the surface area that is touching the table that it'll be sitting on. That decreases the likelihood that the bowl or plate will rock back and forth like the chair at your favorite restaurant. Still wobbling. Think about it. If one single grain of rice gets stuck anywhere underneath this table base, the entire thing will rock. Make a small ring around the outside and you significantly decrease the chance of that grain of rice interfering with the table. So I started by roughly hogging out the center area and then I can come back with some aggressive sanding to smooth things out a bit. I could absolutely stop here and call it a day, but I've seen several power carving videos where people add some fun patterns on the base. So that's what I'm going to do. Let's grab that turbo plane once more and add a pattern. I'm basically just kissing the base with the edge of the disc to create this scalloped pattern. My hope is that with all the weird changes in wood grain, it will create a really unique effect and look pretty cool. It is purely an experiment that has no consequences. If it looks awesome, I know that I can incorporate that scalloped effect into say a drawer front on the dresser, but if it looks terrible, I know never to do it again. And since it's on the bottom of a table, no one will ever see it. As a woodworker, that's one thing I encourage people to do more than anything. Experiment, try something out of your comfort zone that you don't know if you'll be able to pull off. Ask for some help to get past a sticking point in your build. Experiment with a new technique, try a new finish. At the end of the day, doing the same thing over and over again won't make you grow. If I never push myself to start this YouTube channel, I would never be in the position I am today where I get paid to take these weird ideas that I have in my brain and put them out in the real world. Thanks so much for watching and thanks again to Fiverr for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out fiverr.co slash Spensley and check out the services available to you and get 10% off with code Spensley. See you on the next one.